Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to the conversation to this live stream. And today I have a very special guest, and her name is Tama Chansky. Um, and I have a chance for Tama to say hi to everyone. Hi, so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Wonderful. So Tama is uh, will learn a, more, a lot more about her and her book and her story. Uh, in the coming hour, uh, so I'll, I'll get us started. So Tama now is joining us, I believe, from Pennsylvania in the U.S., right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Tama is a psycho psychologist and also a founder and director for the Children's Children's and Adult Center for OCD and, and, and Anxiety. Uh, he's based in Plymouth Meeting, um, Pennsylvania. And she um, has many aspects, <laughs> and of course, of, of, Professionally, as I've, I've talked about, she's a psychologist, and I've been doing this work uh, without with anxiety for um, you know for children up to teenager, and also with their family for decades. She has also been putting out multiple uh, best-selling books, and then this one we have the privilege of talking to her about um, is called uh, "Freeing Your Children from Anxiety," and this is the uh, "From Your Child from Anxiety." Um, but this is already the second um, um, edition, and the reason second is because the first one is so popular. <laughs> um, and also before that, she's written books of um, around um, similar topics, uh, freeing your child from negative uh, thoughts and also fr uh, freeing your child from OCD. So it has been a series of very popular um, books for families who are dealing with um, anxiety issues, both with children and actually with um, family as a whole. And then the third aspect of her is that she's also a lovely mother <laughs> with uh, two daughters and who are now grown. And also what really caught my eye is from the new edition of her book, um, the one who's the illustrator who like drew all the very you know cute and lovely pictures in the book is actually her husband. <laughs> so she definitely has a very supportive and useful family. <laughs> so thank you, Tamara, again for for joining this conversation and for sharing a bit of you know different aspects of you with us. Um, if you don't mind, I'll probably start with the first um, question about um, about about you. Um, so when did you start your career as a psychologist? How old were your children back then? Well, let's see. When I started, I I didn't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, but I knew that I, you know, I was interested in parenting. Interestingly, it just, I I had a sense that this was a great way to work on prevention. By the time, you know, it's sort of by the time adults, even though there's hope for how adults can work on themselves, parenting is just so key to getting a good start and, you know, all along the way, having good messages about the learning process, the growing process. And so that was in my mind, even when I went to graduate school and uh, yeah. And then I had one, one daughter um, during graduate school and then one later. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you feel this way, but you know, sometimes I think, was I hopeful to people before I had children <laughs> what was I talking about? I didn't know anything, you know, you just like, I knew something, but oh my goodness, you learn on the job as a parent every day, right? Yeah. It, it continues. I have grown children. I seriously still feel like I'm learning, you know, <laughs> every day. Yeah. How old are your daughters now? Um, so one is in her mid twenties and the other is in her early thirties. So yeah. Wow. It's <laughs> yeah, <Look at> <laughs> so they're, they're good, but and they're wonderful. And we're very, very close, which is which is great. Um, but you know, life's just always something new, you know. And so it's there's just a, always something to learn and try to do better. <laughs> I know parent, exactly. As a parent, I, was, I remember th this recall. Um, so I I have a talk, had a talk with the author of uh, Ready or Not, Madeline. And she's um she's also a psychiatrist and she's she said she's now learning to a grandparent. She said we need books on grandparenting as well. <laughs> I guess that's exactly as you said. Yeah, um, maybe that will come. Maybe that's that right. will come down the road. We'll see. We'll see what the go. plan is for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then uh, I, I read in your book 
you know, this is, you've been then since then, you know, from a young person with no children to a mother of your own, you know, as, uh, yourself. And then of course, then seeing many, many um, children and a family, you've actually seen thousands, right? If you look back at your career, how many families have you seen? Yeah, definitely thousands, thousands and thousands. I guess at this point, it's been a while. Yeah. And they, they've been, you know, incredible teachers to me as well. You know, that I, I always say to kids, you know, I know about psychology, you know, about yourself, we're going to work together. And, you know, so many kids come to therapy with, you know, just a really unique uh, perspective about what's going on for them and what the problem is. And, you know, they can say that they, they know that they have thoughts that are bothering them. Like they've already, I say to them, you've already figured out the first step, which is to know that these are just thoughts and, you know, they can feel upsetting to you, but in the end, they're just thoughts and you can decide how, what meaning they have, how to evaluate them. And so, you know, because that really is the first step, even the way I, I, uh, explain this to parents is a lot of times when a child is upset, we'll say, why are you scared? And I'll say, you know what, let's, let's edit that a little bit and get a little bit of distance and say, you know, you seem really upset. I want to help. What is, you know, what is worry telling you or what are the thoughts in your mind? Because already that starts to create a little bit of distance. So instead of thinking like I'm scared and there's nothing I can do about it, it's like a, a state that is just overtaking me. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the thoughts that you're having. So the sooner we get to what those thoughts are, then kids can start to evaluate them and make decisions about them. Yeah, yeah. Fr frankly, when I was reading this um, this part in your book, <laughs> I I was thinking, well, this approach is actually very Zen or very you know very Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, you know Buddhism, because that's really what Buddhism is about. is It's about creating a space between your thoughts and yourself yes. um, and, and don't identify yourself with the worry. Um, and although you didn't use this exact words, but just the example you just mentioned is, is exactly that. And saying, instead of saying, you know, what's your problem? Basically that was the first you know, version. You're putting the second version is like, what does the problem tell you, right? So then, so there's something very profound happening there is that suddenly the problem isn't me that the problem is something, you know, on the side. And then that kind of, you know, space or detachment, I think that's what Buddhism call, yes. is actually very critical. It's very profound wisdom. So <laughs> I saw a lot of them in your book. <laughs> yeah. Well, that means a lot to me. Um, and we, you know, I I think it's the, the ancient wisdom that if you were catching up with <laughs> A little bit. And, and, and probably, you know, cognitive behavior therapy in a way that that's, you know, uh, comes from that idea of that our suffering comes from not events necessarily, but how we tell ourselves, you know, what we tell ourselves about those events. And so it is profound and it's also difficult, you know, it's sort of like the simplest idea but you have, I have to keep reminding myself of that, you know, in my own life. And there's a good reason for that, which is that we're wired as much as this wisdom has been there for centuries, you know, our wiring is to get up, you know, mobilized for, mm -hmm. you know, threat immediately if there's something upsetting that we're thinking about. So we, you know, we come by this honestly, all of us that challenge of creating that space because the body is, you know, already has decided before we can even decide how we're going to respond. So, and that's, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of what I do is really normalizing this. These are, you know, there absolutely are, are people with an anxiety disorder for sure, but the experience of stress and anxious thoughts, those are universal experiences for human beings. And just so that we don't have to feel bad about that this is what's happening. It's just important, I think, to name that, that this is this is the kind of predicament that we're that we're in, but there are many things that we can do once we understand that that's what's going on. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Absolutely. The subtitle of the book is called Pre Practical Strategies to Overcome Fears, Worries, and Phobias and Be Prepared for Life from Toddlers to Teens. <laughs> so I think that's what you know the um the you know the book is trying to tell us. Um but I wonder um how did you, you know, like if we kind of back dial a little bit um, on your first thought in writing this book, um, mm -hmm. you know, why, like when, when did you start, you know, decide, say, hey, now, you know, I need to write this book and, and I need to put the strategies in the book to more families. I, I guess I'm asking the first edition that was like now almost 20 years ago, right? How could that be? But I think you're right. <laughs> 2004 if I don't if I recall strange math I don't understand it but I I believe that's the case I don't know how that happened but you know honestly like I said kids just bring so much wisdom of their own you know there's their openness and what I what I found was that I the way kids were describing what they were going through really told a story that I, I wanted to share with more than, you know, how the whatever 10 or 20 or something families that I would see in a week. And that these really were ideas that I, I wanted to get to more parents because, you know, what, what does a parent do when their child is upset? They, they feel like they have a choice either to, take the problem away or sort of make them deal with the problem. And there's so many steps in between those two extremes. And I really wanted to share with, with parents the nitty gritty of just, you know, how do you do that? How, you know, you have an upset child in front of you. How do you get to a place where you make the pause, where you create a learning experience where you let your child know it's okay to feel the way that you're feeling. And actually that feeling is going to go away. If you do these things, like you, you can help that feeling pass. So it's just, I wanted to share what I was learning from the families that I was working with, with other families. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I was really deeply touched by the, actually the first sentence of your author's note, the second edition he said, when I first sit down with a new family in my office, I'll tell them that my goal is to teach them everything I know in the first meeting. <laughs> I was, oh, I, so if I were a family, I would be so thrilled. Well, this, this doctor is so nice and so capable. Like, you know, how, how is it possible? Like, you know, like, <laughs> but, but tell us like, what, why is that intention? Why you want to tell them everything, you know, um, you know, in as a sort of a short fat time as possible. Yeah. I mean, families have such potential to make changes in the quality of their life more, more than I certainly more than I do, you know, for them, they have, they hold that potential, but the more ideas and information and tricks, if you will, just different sort of fun ways of talking about a monster makeover when you have a child who's afraid of the dark or something that, you know, you turn the, the worry into something silly, you draw the, you know, the fears, and then you put funny clothes on them or something like that. You know, that there are just so many tricks and, and uh, strategies that families can use. And the sooner they have them, the better, just the more, you know, fluent they're going to be, and the more confident they're going to feel. Because, you know, parents who have anxious kids feel worried about their children. And if they feel more equipped to make a difference, to know what to do, they're going to feel less anxious themselves. Everything goes better from there. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, even listening to a talk also just, you know, it's very touching to me because I was thinking when I was reading a book, I was saying people in psychology or, in, you know, um, psychiatry, you know, in that mental health general area, um, people have this immense sense of self selfishness <laughs> because I think if in any other trade like for example if I know how to make you know a watch right or something I want to keep it secretive like so you can keep coming to buy things that I know you don't know but mm -hmm. I think in your book um you're basically saying okay this is all my trade secret you know take it away <laughs> right do it yourself and and it's possible 
<laughs> and it's, it's very deeply touching. And also, I think probably many people might have that intention, which is very noble to begin with. But also, it has to be combined, you know, um, combined together with with skills, because oftentimes it's hard to tell those things, right? Because it's like, you know, especially for family, they feel like, well, I didn't go to, you know, graduate school or medical school. I didn't, you know, I didn't get your degrees. I didn't see patients. How is it possible? I don't have those tools. So I think, you know, this book um, has has both. It has both the intention, which, you know, Tara said in the first sentence of your author's note, I want to tell you everything. And second, it really did, because the book did tell you everything. If you, you know, read through it, there are a lot of explanation of why. Um, so you understand what's really going on. And on that basis, there's also a set of tools um, where everybody can use. You don't have to have a graduate degree or go or have been to a medical school to use it. Um, so really kudos to your to your work. It really shows in the book. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I it just, you know, it, we're we're parents, you know, when you understand what's going on, you you just do so much better. Whatever it is, you know. <laughs> do you have any yeah. fears about tech or so you know, like for me, yeah, we all you can look at yourself, the things that you feel afraid of if you have someone teaching you how to simplify it, you're just going to do better. And mm. as much as, you know, what is the, the reason, where are we all headed? We would like, I believe, <laughs> to have a better world for all. Yeah. And when we can, each of us function at the best we possibly can, that's how we create a better world for all. So it's just, it's sort of a a project for a child and for a family, but it contributes to the greater good for for all of us. So, we, you know, if we all do our part, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I'll say something in Chinese. So, so the book's name is called "Children Avoid Anxiety and Fear." It's from Lu Yingjing to China. You can see the Chinese version in the live stream. All right, I'll just say I'm just saying the name and then the content of the book in Chinese so people can buy it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then coming to the to the book itself again. Thank I you for that. Copy right here. You know, <laughs> is this right? Yeah, yeah, that's the Chinese copy exactly. I don't have it yet. I only have the electric version. No, oh. I have the <laughs> I don't have the physical version. But people can find it in the in the link below, 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 wherever that is. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so let's get to the book itself. Um, it's a so for people who haven't who haven't read it, because uh, I have I have the privilege of doing it. It's a it's a very easy book to read because it's written in a very friendly and easy language. Um, it has um, the the I think it's it has four parts, which again you know too bad we don't have enough time to go through all of it. But I, I want to give everyone a bit of an overview. So the first part is called uh, anxiety disorder basics. Like basically, what do you need to know to set your child free? Like what are the fundamentals? Because I think people hear the word anxiety, depression a lot. But, you know, again, just like myself, I said, I'm not a doctor. Like, you know, my first reaction might be, okay, like we need to go see a doctor. But, you know, we might need to educate ourselves on the anxiety disorder basics. Like those are actually not hard. It's not rocket science. It is science, <laughs> but it's understandable science. So that's the first part. And then the second part is behind the scenes in your brain, teaching your child to outsmart the tricks, uh, outsmart the tricks the brain can play, um, can play. So Tara is basically saying that there, there are a lot of um, tricks our brain play on us actually with a good intention. It's actually trying to protect us. This is like how human has evolved, you know, over tens of thousands of years. But this is how the, the you know, understanding that. And then so that's actually very fundamental in outsmarting it. And then there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, um, six, seven chapters in that part, which is really you know going very deep um, in understanding um, the, the 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 science and then sort of the behind all the um, all the all the things we feel, um, and then as a result, we can outsmart it. And the third part is all worries, great and small, basically talking about common childhood fears and worries and problem anxieties. I think everybody probably have something like, for example, my oldest son, who's 14, is afraid of the dark. Right. So I'm sure there are a lot of things that, you know, like the nightmares, there are different things or they're, they're, you know, going to meet strangers, you know, social anxiety and all kinds of things. So I think um, Tamara has put all of them together called, you know, great and small um, in the third part, in the, in the third part of the book. 
So I'm sure everybody can find okay, your problem there. <laughs> it's like a collection and this, you know, having understanding of it. And part four is called anxiety beyond a diagnosis, meaning like, you know, after we seeing that, you know, as a um, disease or a situation we have to deal with, you know, what are the things we can really do to free ourselves and free our children from it in our day-to-day -day life? So that really brings us almost, I feel like when I was reading the book, it's like a U-curve. You go, you know, from understanding basics to go very deep on part two, part three. Um, and then, you know, on part four, it comes out again saying, okay, now you've learned all the knowledge, you understand all the mechanisms, and those are the things you can do in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, so it looks like nothing happened, but a lot have happened. <laughs> it's a very, very fundamental sort of a learning curve. So I want to give everyone a bit of the, the taste of the book. Again, you can find um, find the book um, in the shopping cart and um, the, chi the Chinese version, you can read it yourself. But this is really how the book is structured. Um, so after, thank you for listening to all that. I know this is very familiar too, because you wrote it. <laughs> and then I wanted to um, then pose the question to you, Tamara. It's like, um, I think people hear about anxiety a lot, but when you actually first wrote the book, when it's 20 years ago, it, it, it isn't as much a buzzword yet, right? I suppose, um, because I think it's probably in the last 10, five years, maybe this is becoming a much more a social sort of um, knowledge, like people all know. Before it was more treated as a disorder or you know some, some category of minor situation. Was it the case? Like how was the, I think you have the sort of invaluable experience of experience in time. <laughs> as a psychologist what have you seen as the trend in the past you know quarter century um yeah. if you don't mind and i i really think it it does go back like that far because even when i wrote the first edition that uh you know studies were finding that the average in the, U the u.s anyway the average rate of stress um in a, a typical school child in I think it was like the late 1990s was the same or or greater than the stress level of um you know patients in a psychiatric institute in the 1950s. So just what has been happening which is of great concern because stress is not neutral. It really affects the body. <laughs> It affects sleep. It affects, you know, learning. There's so many things. So we are seeing this just sort of gradual increase that has not stopped over, you know, at least 25 years. Then with the pandemic and, you know, other things that have, uh, you know, definitely social media, just their other kind of world events, if you will, that have really um, escalated that further. But this has been the case going, you know, for, for many decades at this point where, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in a way uh, what happens I think is that people can say like, well, yeah, everybody has anxiety, you know, okay, true, but that doesn't mean we don't do anything about it. You know, that means more people are struggling <laughs> because mm -hmm. of it. So let's just do some simple things to educate them about, hey, you can check in with, you know, what are you thinking? What's your first version of the story of, you know, when you're going to try out for a play or take a test, everything's going to be terrible, you know, I'm going to fail or I'm not going to get the part. And then, okay, yeah, go back in and fact check that. What do you really think is going to happen? Your worry will always sound the same. My worry, your worry, everyone's worry sounds the same in a sense that it's always the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. How much of the time is that how it actually turns out? Or even that we believe that that's how it's going to turn out if we ask ourselves that question, you know, it, it doesn't turn out that way. But if mm -hmm. we don't ask those second questions and get that edited version of the narrative, even mm -hmm. with a five-year-old, you can do this, you know, the five-year-old's like, I, you know, I can't go to school. I, no one's going to be nice to me. <laughs> or something. You say, you know, I, I understand that my worry might say that too. What, what else do you think might happen when you go to school? Do you think there might be some kids who are nice? You don't, you know, and then the child starts to think about it differently. And, you know, maybe they think, well, Yes, so-and-so was, they did, 
you know, save a seat for me yesterday at, you know, at, in the cafeteria. It's like, yeah, good, interesting. So maybe worry needs to learn. Maybe you can teach worry how things really work. Then the child starts to understand, don't take worry's word, you know, as truth, fact yeah. check. That, that is yeah. a strategy, you know, adults can use, kids can use. How do you want to fact check your fear? You mm -hmm. know, see if you really think that's true or what you think is more true. Yeah, yeah. Something simple like that, because when you think something more accurate, uh, it's got, it's going to be less, you know, catastrophic. You're going to feel better and you're going to be willing to try things. So it's mm -hmm. really... It has, you know, multiple kind of a uh, cascade of consequences in a in a positive way that yeah. you're willing to approach something if you have a more accurate story about what it's going to be like. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think this is really part of the your toolbox calling uh, raising worry wise children, right? <laughs> so it's not instead of worrisome, it's worry wise. And I like in the book, um, I have the English version where you have the fear extinguisher, <laughs> where where oftentimes we would think, okay, there's a fear, or there's a worry, let's just, you know, kill it. But actually what really how it works is that you need to have a develop a set of skills of having a conversation with worry, or as you say, one example is having a fact check and saying, okay, you know, this is the things that, you know, because every, our mind tend to go to the catastrophic you know, results very quickly, right? But facts are usually not like that. And having that, I think uh, Phil, your husband has drawn this nice picture of the, the real di distinguisher um, or extinguisher. I actually have multiple tools coming out. <laughs> That's, you know, like maybe tell us a bit, what do you mean by, by worry wise? Yeah, it's that that's that's really what it is, is that if you look a little bit deeper, not even that much deeper, <laughs> but just, you don't take, I, I always say worry has the first word, but we can make sure that it doesn't have the last, word. you know, <laughs> one of the tricks is that I say, you know, if you're in class and uh, the teacher asks a question and somebody shouts out the answer, just because they got there first, it just means they're fast. Do they always get it right? No, there's no guarantee of that. And that's how it is with our worry too. It's very fast. That's how we're built, you know, to to survive. Uh, but it's it's not it's not accurate. And so we can then come up with a second thought, which is more accurate about what you know what's happening. That is how we are wise about how worry works, rather mm -hmm. than just having it kind of run us. We can do something differently with our worry thoughts and then you know the the world opens up in a sense with what is more possible and what is more likely to happen mm. the world gets less scary because we're thinking about it more accurately i you know sometimes i'll i'll say to kids it's like let's read you know a, i don't know a child's um going to a sleepover. I don't know if that's something, you know, that's relevant, but a lot of the kids that I see might be afraid to do that. And will say, you know, let's read, what is worries telling you about that? Let's read the worry story. <laughs> and then, you know, let's read, let's fact check that. And it's kind of like, what's the boring story is what mm -hmm. actually happens, which is not much happen. You know, it's like, worry just amplifies things so much and it helps to have a little levity to say like tell me the boring story you know like the teacher's going to get mad at me or something is the worry story and you know what actually happens at school maybe not that much it's kind of the boring story boring story we can live with much better right? <laughs> yeah that's lovely yeah, I think it's a it's it's having a conversation with your let's read the worry story as you say, right? So basically, I, again, I think that I see two sort of two level of wisdom in your approach. One, you know, as, as we said in the beginning, like once you separate the worry from you, suddenly this is something it's 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 object. It's not a subject anymore. 
And suddenly you can examine this thing and you have, you know, like this is not dominating you anymore. You actually rather, rather this is just something that's happening. And second is that by reading that story and having a conversation with it, you make it less um, opaque because I think things are more scary when it's opaque, right? If you see like just a bunch of things over there, you don't know really what, what that is. It's, you know, it's, it's scary. But once you know, oh, it's like, you know, I'm worried that I don't have a blanket or something like that, right? So then it becomes much more concrete. I think that's really the, the, the lot of wisdom in that um, worry wise conversation. You just use that example. Yeah. And it's so, you know, if we as parents see that opportunity to not just tell our kids everything's going to be fine, but to take the couple of seconds to say, oh, well, what's your worry telling you about such and mm. such? You can mm. fact check or maybe you're going to problem solve what, you know, what to do. I was just uh, talking to a, a, a 10 year old uh yesterday or today, I guess. And, uh, you know, we were talking about she was going to fly for the first time by herself. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, well, you know, what if I'm hungry? I usually my parents will, you know, go to the whatever Starbucks or something in the airport <laughs> and, and get the food. So I don't know what to do. And I said, yeah, that's a really good question. You know, what about doing some dress rehearsals before you get to the airport, go to Starbucks with your, you know, with your mom or your dad a couple of times and learn, you know, just practice ordering yourself so you can see, you know, how, how it works and that you can, you know, sometimes it is that it's all about uh, what the thoughts are that are distorting the risk. And sometimes, especially with kids, mm -hmm. it's really about, you know, there's just a, a gap of experience and they need to practice and then they've got it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, I think we don't want to overlook that aspect of it, especially when we're talking about kids, because they don't, you know, they do have new, I mean, we have new experiences, not as often, right? Let's face it. Yeah, <laughs> Probably. But kids, you know, a lot of things are are new for kids. They don't know how things work. You know, I one of the stories that I tell in the in the book is that I was at uh, while I was working on, I guess, the first edition. I was at an aquarium, <laughs> and uh, I went in the bathroom, <laughs> and next to me in the stall next to me was a mom and a daughter, and the the mom was saying, you know, after this we're going to go see the sharks. And the girl just screamed <laughs> because <laughs> what did that in the picture in her mind is like, she's going to be confronted with a shark. She had, you know, so, I mean, I just, I love that because it was just like, exactly. How would she know that the sharks <laughs> in the tank? How would she know that? But there's so many things like that for kids that unless we just kind of walk through and hear what they're expecting or what they're imagining, and then we can kind of help them fill in the blanks. Yeah. Well, then the, the truth of what they're going to encounter is just much safer, more familiar to them. And so, yeah, never, never, never miss the opportunity to find out what your child is thinking. So you, right. can, you know, you, I would be afraid if I were going to encounter a shark myself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think um, Tara has actually shared with us um, uh you know, just even very upfront in the book, three lessons, right? So you actually touched on that already. I'll just read to the reader so you know like what, what um, the book has been uh, telling us. You said the first lesson is it's not a situation. It's just the worry. It's such a story. The worry brain is telling you. I think that's what you just mentioned earlier in our conversation and talking about, okay, what does the worry tell you? What does it say? Mm -hmm. And I think the shark, um, uh, you also mentioned, I think the second story, a second lesson, which is do the side-by-side -side comparison, choose the real deal. Meaning like, you know, it's, you know, like they're usually facts will turn out much better than our worry. So having ability to see that. And then the third one, I think is what you're referring to is called exposure and desensitization, meaning using, you basically saying you have to expose, you know, expose them to, to the, what the worry situation is. And when you say, you know, do a few trips or, you know, try to go to Starbucks and yourself, 
that's basically what you said is a desensitization process, right? So like, you know, when, when it's just the idea in your thought, it seems so, you know, like adult, like, like I can't do it my sister, my parents. But if you can go up a few times, of course, in this case, probably with the support of your uh, parents to begin with, then things become easy, right? So, oh, it's just, you're desensitized. You said using planned discomfort to prove that worry is wrong. <laughs> I like the planned discomfort. Can you give us a few more examples? Like how do we plan uh, discomfort? Yeah, you know, and I, I would just say that patience is so important with this. You know, if parents, and I know life moves fast, we have so many demands as parents, but it's gonna be worth taking it a little bit slower because your child will cooperate and be willing to do the exposures, the, you know, experiments to get used to something. If we rush them, they may say, I can't, I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. And then, you know, they, they feel like they're going to, they need to avoid a situation. You know, let, I think another example in the book, but I encounter this a lot is whether it's going to sports or like swimming lessons or something like that, where kids, it's a new situation and they are afraid of going, what's going to happen? Are the people going to be nice? Am I going to be bad at it? Whatever it is. And sometimes it's a matter of just being willing to say, you know, look, let's go check it out. Let's see how it is. You know, if, if all the kids hate it, <laughs> If they're all unhappy because the coach is really mean, well, that's a different situation, but let's go see, you know, so you sort of give some room for that and the child can go and check it out. And, you know, if you, if you can make that room yourself for the idea that they could be on the sidelines a little bit and be observers until they're ready to join that goes such a long way, you know, a lot of times without that option of easing in, mm -hmm. kids will say, I can't do this. And then parents are in the situation of like, what do I, this was supposed to be fun. What do I do? Force them to do something that I, while they're, you know, crying, <laughs> that's not gonna, <laughs> what a reward is that for no one, right? Um, you know, so if you can say like, look, what's worry telling you that, you know, what are you picturing? What's worry telling you about it? You know, that the person, the coach is going to be mean or something like, okay, I really don't think that they are, you know, but let's go see, let's see what, you know, what this person is like, or let's look at their picture online. You know, there's so many things that you can do. And sometimes just being willing to, again, like the shark tank, just go into the child's world of what, what they're picturing and what they need to know that it's okay to approach, then, mm -hmm. you know, they're willing to do that. So um, that kind of creative, again, it, it's a way of thinking. Right mm -hmm. now, it may seem like, oh, gosh, that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have time. But you know, it becomes a way of thinking and it actually is a time saver. If yeah. you get used to asking these little, little questions like, oh, okay, what are you thinking? Or what's worry telling you about it? Do you have a different idea about it? Or, you know, what do you, what would your friends say about that? Just get some conversation going. The picture starts to shift and you get cooperation the child feels supported by you. So their nervous system down regulates. So they're more willing to try things. So, you know, actually being in a worry wise household, things tend to move faster, even though there might be more conversation, there's less sort of pushback about, you know, uh, new experiences because the child trusts that you'll work through it with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when you what you you what you just shared, there there are two like gems I picked up. One, you were saying going into the child's world, right? So like I think it's that's probably the the easiest and also the hardest thing to do <laughs> because going to the child world, meaning just like in that situation when you see the you know in the stall next to you talking about a tank or a shark. Um, and then the child world is that, wow, the, the shark is the thing I see in the picture book is like, it's scary. It's, you know, it gets bloody. Um, and, and our parents have a different world for the shark, right? So like, you know, for shark for us is something in the tank is very safe. 
So when we're in this world, it's impossible for us to understand her worry or her anxiety was, oh, this is your make a fuss about it. Like, you know, what to cry about. This is so safe. But she didn't know. Right. So I think, you know, having being able to step down, step into the children's world is probably the first step for everything. Yes. Um, I just want to stress it because when you said it, you I think I don't want people to miss it. It's similar because in, in the book I wrote, I, I said the same thing. I was like, you know, for 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 us, we for for us, we function in our mind. And our mind is, is in a way for adults is an educated mind, right? So we've, we've seen everything, we know what it is and children are not. So like, then if we, you know, this two world, a parallel world, they don't cross, then all the conversation or the strategy doesn't work. And then there's no way for them to get up to our level. So the only possibility is for us to go down to their level. <laughs> and I wouldn't say go, go down because go down means like, you know, we're demeaning them. No, meaning like, you know, actually their world is probably more in the moment you know, more their physical experience world. And then it's almost a chance for us to give away our mind stuff and our concepts and going down to that. I think that's probably the hardest transition as an adult, as a parent. Um, and the second piece I want to pick up you mentioned is this this piece about saving time. Because I think usually people don't want to go there. They was like, ah, you know, just go. Like, you know, like we, it's time for to go swimming. Just get out of the door now. Like as if this is the fast way of getting things moving. But this is probably the biggest, you know, irony. Actually, this is probably the slowest way to get things moving. Not only slow, it maybe just break the whole thing. I'm not going. I'm just throwing my bag away. <laughs> but so like oftentimes we're stuck on this fast track. We want to get things done. Of course, as adults, we have a lot going on in our life. We are scheduled. We have things to catch up on. Um, but actually understanding that being able to have those conversations is actually the shortcut. Yes. It's actually the fastest way of solving a problem. I think that's a very difficult and very important con uh, concept to get. And then, so even if our, our, our intention is to save time to be as fast as possible, we should learn that, you know, like the, the, the yelling way or the forcing way is actually, you know, is actually the wrong way. It, it ends up destroying things or delaying things. It's yeah. this conversation actually speed it up, right? <laughs> exactly. But I, I think, I think we're up to the challenge right? As parents <laughs> to, <laughs> to learn that new trick. And the thing is that it, you know, as we, as we do that, we, you know, we get more into a pattern of that. And so we can learn, we can learn that it's like the first step, I think in, in all, all my books, I say is to empathize and connect. It's just sort of drop your agenda for just a second <laughs> and say, you know, I see you're really struggling, like, how can I help? Or like, what's going on or something like that. And that, yeah, that will be a time saver thing to say. Your child might be stunned that you're not saying like, get in the car, you know, or something like that. But over time, I mean, this is, it really is, it's a relationship, you know, that as you work on your own skills of being just a little bit more patient and strategic, your child anticipates that you're going to be helpful to them. So everyone's nervous system is kind of quieter and operating in a better, you know, uh, realm. And so, you know, also your, your child becomes more cooperative that way because they know you're going to be helpful to them. I and mean, it's just, it, I love that about, you know, that's how you get more people on the job, basically, you know, that just with these, these patterns start to change. And it's really, it's really helpful to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I like, I love what you're saying is, is basically those words are building a relationship. And then, but usually we want the results, right? So we want either you be on time or do something or go somewhere. But actually result is simply a result. And then a relationship is something that make the results natural and easy uh so like oftentimes we were we we're we we're too focused on the result itself and actually forget about what actually lead to the results <laughs> right so actually that kind of investment is really the right investment to get the result we wanted <laughs> it's so yeah. true it's just it's a little bit it's not that subtle right it's not right. Nuanced, but it's a little bit right it's just yeah that you know, I mean, we probably encourage patience in our children, but yeah. we, we need to be good role models. You know, we need to also be willing to pivot 
you know, to a, a different way of, of doing things. And, you know, we will get better at that. We yeah. do more of what works, you know, yeah. and the brain, you know, then it, it just, it's, you become a better problem solver because your brain is used to, to doing that. So, right. yeah. Right. Exactly. So that's why I think when I was reading your book, that's how I felt because, you know, now I think in the past maybe 10 years or so, this whole um, realm of mindfulness, of being in the now, um, you know, as is b- becoming much more popular, at least it's in workplace. Um, workplace, we'll talk about, okay, being mindful, breathing, breathing out. And, but, you know, being with the children is probably the best free training for being mindful. <laughs> you don't have to pay for anything, but, you know, like, but it, it, to, to, to have that relationship requires us actually to drop our agenda. Cause we, as adults have so many agenda. I mean, par- partially it's necessary for life, but with children, they are like, that's, that's what I wrote in my book does. I think children, one of their function must be to remind us as a human being, like when you drop your agenda, <laughs> I you know that's that. that. yes <laughs> they are our best teachers right who's right. teaching who's teaching who right exactly. <laughs> in, in a lot of ways yeah it's like you know you're in a frenzy with something in your mind and then you look at your child in front of you and you're just like how is this important look at look at who I have in front of me right it's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So interesting. I think this this book also gave me the sense of if I use one kind of abstract word to describe how I feel about this book, it's 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 a very high sense of fluidity, meaning like it's it flows. Um, so give you like all the questions you asked, the tactics you give to the readers, the tools you provide, is all in a way. Yeah, I think collectively they're 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 providing a higher level of fluidity, or they're unfreezing some of the frozen points. <laughs> I say, hey, you can flow a bit, and then you know you can follow. You know, like then there are things they say, like if you drop, you know, certain ideas that make sense. There, there are certain you know things we can do to detach, right? To have this conversation with the worry, have the worry in their own place. It's very fluid. That's how I felt. I think that's why part of it is it's, it's a it's a deeply mindful book. <laughs> I really appreciate that, that overview uh, reflection. I I really appreciate that because I do think that, you know, what is the opposite of anxiety is fluidity because anxiety is being stuck. Uh, Yeah. You know, it's, it's really, it's not being able to take action. It's feeling paralyzed with your perceptions, maybe with your bodily like sensations with panic or something like that. And the opposite of that is being able to move. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for for putting all those tools out there. Now I'm going to ask a million dollar question. Okay. okay I have to listen up, okay? <laughs> so so Harma has, has, has been, you know, consulting thousands of patients now over, you know, multiple decades. Um, if you can recall in your practice, you know, if there are three things or sentences you'll say that's most effective, what are those? What are those, the three sentences? What are the things, the phrases you would use that, you know, that helps the patients the most? Wow. That's a great question. That is a million dollar question. I don't know. I, I'll i do my best. <laughs> I, I think it's, I don't know if you have this game in China, but um, here we have a game, pin the tail on the donkey. Mm-hmm. And so, if this is kind of walk with me for a second, I promise I will get back to your, your question, but you know, the game is there's a, there's a donkey and you are blindfolded and you have a tail and the kids get spun around and then they have to, you know, try to pin the tail in the right place. Okay. What am I talking about? What I, one of the lines that I always say to parents is to not get confused about what the problem is. It's not your child. It's not the situation even. Pin the problem on the problem. And the problem is what is worry telling your child about that situation? Because so often parents are like, why are you thinking that way? Or it's fine. That's about the child. That's about the situation. It's not about the thoughts. The question is, asking your child, what is worry telling you about this? Or, you know, what are the thoughts in your head about this? So that's, that's number one. Um, Number two is taking the, the time to connect with your child through empathy. Always, you know, 
again, we can say, well, we have all these, you know, strategies and everything, but if you don't have a willing nervous system, it'll slide right off. If your child is not in the optimal zone of, you know, being receptive to learning, it doesn't matter how great you could memorize this book. <laughs> it, you know, you have to make that connection with your child and say like, you know, I'm here, I'm here to help. I under, you know, I know this is really hard. I want to help you. And that's how you can then go forward. And the other, you know, I really think is that I say, just break it down and trust that you'll adjust. One of the things, yeah, I use the analogy of a swimming pool about getting used to new experiences. I'll say to kids, you know, what, what do you feel, you know, so a child's afraid to, you know, go to the first day of school or, you know, go take a test or go to a birthday party or give a speech or something like that. And they're focused on how they're going to feel at the beginning. And they think that's the whole thing. And so, of course, they don't want to do it because it feels terrible. <laughs> but I say, you know, what happens when you go into a swimming pool? What does it feel like? Cold. It doesn't feel good. And I say, right. And, you know, what happens a couple minutes later? They say it feels good. And I say, how does that happen? You know, did somebody come in and warm up the pool or something? And they say, no, I just got used to it. And I say, exactly. That is the thing to know that that's, that's something you can trust about your body. We get used to things. So if you are willing to take the first couple steps in, you're going to get used to it. Your anxiety is going to come down. If you'd never go, you know, play with a dog or go, you know, try out for, you know, a play or something like that, you'll never know that you could and you will adjust and your anxiety will come down. So I guess really, yeah, sort of empathy, pinning the problem on the problem and trusting that you'll adjust. Wow. Thank you. That's $3 million. <laughs> How did, I, yeah, how did that come across? I hope that I hope that was uh, I hope that was useful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because I think because it's it's a uh, like your experience and in time, this two compound is something that money cannot buy. Because I think that's what what that's why this kind of your reaction is 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 very valuable to every to everybody who's doing that. That means you know what Hamas just shared is something that applies to most situations and can really unstuck you from those situations, right? Using the earlier words. And um, and thank you <laughs> for sharing that wisdom. All right, now I'm greedy. I'm going to ask another million dollar question okay. for the parents. <laughs> so again, you've seen many families showing up in your in your room, right? And then, um, and I can't imagine even reading your book and edit too, like people probably are kind of desperate when I when they went to you, right? Even they, and all the situations you described, because again, this book, you can get it yourself, you know, by in the shopping cart below. Um, has many, many real cases. Um, and again, I'm really grateful for you for your patients who are willing to having those cases being known. Because it's in a, in a way, it has a sense of, well, it's just not me. Like there, you know, there, there, there are many, many situations. And in lots of situations, even when I read it, I feel, wow, this is tough. You know, this is this is very heavy. And, you know, there's, you know, like this is. So I can imagine if I were those family, I would be really, I would be kind of in some kind of despair when I show up at your office. Mm -hmm. um, what are the few things you say, again, if you have three sentences, that that turn the parents from a stage of despair to a place of hope? Like, how did they start that journey? Because, you know, when they show up in your office, probably already after a lot of struggles, right? And then in front of you, again, in your, in your decades of experience, what are the things you would say to the parents, to adults who are sort of feeling I'm kind of hopeless, like we're sort of in a hellhole now? Yeah. What are the things that you tell them to, give, to get them started on the, on the upward journey? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, you know, two things I, I do... One is normalizing anxiety. You know, I usually when with kids, I'll say, I'm going to ask you a trick question when they just first meet me. And I say, OK, how many people in the world do you think worry? You know, and they're like, uh -huh. I said, it's a trick question. The answer is everyone, you know. So and I say 
the difference between your brain and somebody else who, you know, is not coming into my office, they, they have the same thoughts, just their brain knows what to do with them. And that's what we're going to teach you. So really making it very hopeful from the get-go that this is a solvable problem. Fortunately, I'm not a researcher, but fortunately there are researchers out there <laughs> and they have found that anxiety is the most treatable psychiatric condition. Kids get better and they stay better. So I can actually, you know, confidently tell parents and kids that kids with, you know, with anxiety who go through the kind of, uh, you know, skill building that I'm going to be working with them on, they learn how to do things differently on the outside, but actually their brain retains though they make new patterns about how to kind of short circuit the the you know the worry brain and to get more to the the wisdom and that's they really change how they think and see things so i fortunately you know i mean that makes it my job a lot easier is the fact that there are people who do research who've shown that but i see it i mean i wouldn't be I, I wouldn't be here. I would have, you know, found another career path, I guess, if if uh, it wasn't working out so well for my patients, I would say, oh, gosh, I don't, this isn't good. They're not getting better. I don't want to do this. So, you know, I know from my own experience and from what the research shows that kids can really learn these skills. It feels good to them because they nobody wants to be stuck. We're not born that way. We don't want that. And it just, if we can simplify what to do, kids want to do that. So yeah, that's the good yeah. news. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I'm going to add $1 million to that is actually, okay. you, you don't have to spend, um, this is not a challenge to Tamara anymore. This is for our uh, audience or readers who are listening is that if you read the book, you spend very little money to get a million, million dollar advice. <laughs> and one thing very interesting um, to me, when you, uh, to add probably to the, to the second question, the, your answer to the second question is you actually said in the book, it says children already have the skills to overcome worry. Thank you. Right. That was in the beginning of the right. second edition. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. They, they know how to thank you for reminding me of what I wrote in that book. <laughs> One of the things, I, <laughs> I appreciate it. You know, do kids, when you ask them to do something, do they say like, why? Why do I have to? Like they, there are ways that kids know to say no to <laughs> even an authority like their parents, you know, so they understand that idea. That's one of the things that they can do when you start to teach them that the authority, that worry only pretends to be an authority, really, and the kids are going to be the better teachers of their worry that they can, you know, they can say no. Kids learn, you know, uh, from commercials what's real and what isn't. And kids do kind of like to be bossy and in charge in charge of things which is great and they can learn that that's something that they can do with their worry as well yeah yeah exactly and then this is also written in a, such a humorous and 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 sharp way because for example i think tamara is trying to tell us you know like we should tell tell our children to ignore um to ignore the the voice of the worry sometimes Right. And then probably we will think, oh, there's no way, because when the voice of the worry came out, it's so loud, it's so dominating. But basically, Tamara is saying in the book, well, though they know how to ignore. If you ask them to turn off the video game, they ignore you. <laughs> if you ask Great them to do examples. a right? And you ask them to clean up their room, they ignore you. Right? <laughs> so, so definitely they have that skill. Although, yeah, kind of, you know, make you laugh. But that's true. It's not like they don't have the ability to ignore. They're just being selective. But yes. being selective is a good news, meaning they actually have the ability. Then that's you know only on that basis you can be selective. Yes. So I think this this whole you know segment of the book is just you know very like you know funny way almost, but you know very truth telling way, saying that all the two sets that um that Tama is telling patients and families are in this book, you know how you deal with anxiety, deal with depression. Actually, you are born with it and use it pretty well. <laughs> 
You just need someone to connect those dots for you that it's okay. I mean, really, yeah, that it's okay to use those skills in this kind of situation. Right, right, exactly. And then I think one of the things is also you use your swimming pool example and saying actually kids already know how to get used to things that are hard at, at first. Right. So like, you know, they, they know, like when they first try something, you know, the swimming pool experience is the same, you know, like it's not a hundred percent children won't go to the swimming pool. They all ended up trying most of them. So it's not like they don't know how to do it, yes. but exactly as what Karma said, he's connecting those thoughts. Hey, remember that time when you did that, that's exactly, you're using the muscle. You actually have that muscle. You have it, you use it pretty well. And now you just use the same muscle on this situation. Right. So I think that's, that, 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 that's very profound. And then like, and then, and then it's like, when I was reading this, I was like, aha, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, and that's how, you know, kids can really, parents can get out of that role of feeling like they have to force their kids to do things, which just backfires as we were talking about earlier, but that kids see like, oh yeah, you know, how did I learn how to do addition? Yeah. I practiced it a lot then it got easier, you know, or how did I learn to sleep in my own bed or, you know, s- sleep with just a nightlight or something like that. They practice and then they got used to it. So it's just- oh, like, Hold on one second. I have to open the door. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm back. <laughs> All right, I think we're- just one second, because my son is coming back. I'll make sure there's no noise. Already. Okay. Sorry, missing the last. Real part. life. You're you have your children coming in. For me, I said to my husband, "Please keep the cats downstairs because they will start." To- to meow and you know <laughs> claw at the door that those are the children that I have around this yeah, no. <laughs> you have kitten children <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, yeah yeah that was my okay good um already so we were we were saying no okay you're just yeah we were, on yeah, that we were talking about getting used to it and how to kids yeah how to kids you know yeah. learn they practice and it's the same thing with anxiety. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that in that, in that again, segment of the book, I think there's a very long list. I was like, well, there's another page, there's another page. <laughs> but it's really fun saying that actually a lot of the things we um, you know, we think it's difficult, it's hard, is the skill we already have. And so reminding ourselves we have it and reminding our children they have it is actually, you know, a very uh, strong start. So like, it's not something I have to acquire from some outer universe. (laughs) And if I can just stick in one more practical idea along those lines, you know, one of the things levity is so helpful. It's also the opposite of anxiety, you know, kind of sarcasm, or I'll have kids say, you know, I'll say, look, now you know what worry is. It's not Like, it's just an idea. It's not an authority that you need to listen to. Why don't you play around with the voice of worry? Maybe you'll sing a song, you sing your worries in a song like happy birthday, or you'll say the worry in a different accent or something like that. And it just changes how they feel about those words. So that, you know, that can be uh, something that kids can do right away as well. Think of a cartoon character who's going to be their worry, draw it. All of those things downgrades the, the fear and the authority of those thoughts. And that's really helpful to kids. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I remember that's also one of the tools, one of the million tools in this book. <laughs> and you can use and also have, having, uh, having them write down what the worry is. So it's, I think, similar to what Tama just mentioned is making this thing concrete, right? So once you, you know, make it from this very abstract thing to a concrete thing you can interact with, either it's a voice, a cartoon character or something you wrote down. And suddenly, you know, their power, is, you know, is decreased by 90% or 99%, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing, um, it was similar to what, because I, when I, in my book, I also said, you know, everybody has this magic tool at home, which is all the children have fluffy animals, right? So you have your fluffy animals, so pick one, right? So they give the, a character, 
you know, like, you know, I use, I often use it in a different way because of course, as a, as you probably know, as a mother, you get mad all the time. <laughs> you regret it, but ah, next time you happen again. I have so no I, idea what you're talking about. Please stop. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like then what I, I used, I, I used one of the animals, the stuffy animals to be my criticizer. So there's the, you know, like, you know, once I get mad or something, this fluffy animal would be like speaking like as my authority, like yelling at me, how can <laughs> and every, that's so great yeah so every time my 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 daughter this especially my youngest is a daughter who's 10 now like you like become so empowered and suddenly like somebody like is a higher authority than your parent that can speak to her or speak for her um and that's very powerful so i i was recommending using that but i was thinking that's exactly you can use it too like because you, you just need an imaginary character you can make it very concrete you know find a you know a fluffy animal that's worry <laughs> right and then and then you can basically play with it and then suddenly things become so you know like you're so so I'm fearful right yeah and if you don't have you know stuffed animals around if you're in the car or whatever at the train station or something you can just use your hands where he's saying like you have to do it like this or it's going to be terrible and you say like what's you know what does your smart side say that's not true you know like you have the magic tools anywhere you go really you go exactly wow thank you for all that um again I, you know this is as i said this is just one of the million tools that when i say a million dollar questions i literally mean it <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this book. Um, and I know we're about time. I think I'll, I have two last questions, if you don't mind. One is that, um, as you probably gathered, you know, so far, we didn't even get to the depths of the book. Uh, so the book itself, as I said, in the beginning, have four parts, and it really goes, you know, again, I I understand as a U-shaped curve, like, you know, going very deep into some of the, the fundamentals and basics, kind of unpeeling a lot of the, the, the tricky situations at home, and then coming out. Um, but I do want to ask one question related, you know, in that deep curve, <laughs> if you don't mind. So I think our readers or audience can also get a sense of what's being talked about in the book. So I think there's one, uh, I, I forgot in which chapter, but it, I, I, I remember it very dearly. You talk about how to help your children to get unstuck. Um, I think that's, is it part, part three or part two? Oh, part two. You're talking about how to change your child's thinking and get them unstuck. This is the part two, which is behind the scenes in your brain, teaching your children or child to outsmart the tricks and brain that can play. So what do you mean by change their thinking and get them unstuck? And you know, if I haven't read the book, like can you can can, can you tell me what are you trying to say in that chapter? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, you know, if we think about uh, we won't approach something that we think is dangerous or too hard. And mm -hmm. so, at, you know, so the stuckness is thinking that it's too scary or it's too hard. And so how do we help kids get unstuck? One is really tapping into their experience of just what are they thinking is going to happen? What are they expecting is going to happen in that situation? And then helping them fact check that narrative, filling in with details, you know, uh, where necessary to have a different story about what's more accurate about that situation. But the other thing really is then this practice that we've been talking about. One of the, <laughs> I think a, a million dollar question that parents can say to kids really is, you know, what part of, you know, kids will say, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this or, you know, something along those lines. And if a parent says, okay, what part of this do you think you could do it? You know, you can say no to things, but I just need a part that you can say yes to, because we were talking about patience earlier. Things take time. If you're willing to be patient, they'll actually move more, you know, smoothly if you can ask more, like, what is the child ready to do? They'll find something that they are willing to do. They might say like, well, I could be in the parking lot <laughs> of the soccer, you know, and you say like, okay, well, you know, maybe, and what's the one step after that in case that's, you know, feels too easy for you or something like that. 
Um, but you just you just look for the first stepping stone. That's how you get you help get kids get unstuck is just not being rigid like you were saying. This is about fluidity. If we're not rigid, thinking like the only success is the bullseye. It has to be exactly the goal that I have in mind. It's like, okay, I'm gonna be flexible if anything's on the board of the the bullseye, uh, you know, the dartboard, that's gonna be okay. Cause I know if they start, eventually they're gonna get where they need to go. A lot of times, you know, parents will will uh, say this and I certainly see it in my work that kids will say, you know, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. If we're willing to just be flexible for that first step, once they're there, they warm up. They do look at the kids who are having fun. They kind of see the shark is not <laughs> out of the tank, so to speak, you know, and they're just, they feel more comfortable with the situation because none of the things that they thought were going to, you know, it was going to look like, or were going to happen turn out to be the way it is. So that flexibility of just what's the part that you feel like you're ready to do or yeah. ready to try really, because right. trying you don't exactly know how it's going to work out, but trying is trying. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think if I may add one <clears throat> is because when you're talking, it reminded me so much of my memory with my kids is also when you, when they're successful in those trying, like, as you said, you know, parking lot easy or, you know, something's easy. Um, spend time to talk about those positive experiences right mm -hmm. so you go go back home and saying hey that was easy and then like and you you know use what time I offer in the book do the sort of the the, the the two columns like this is what you thought this is yeah. the reality and then, so that process reinforced that in their brain right so because mm -hmm. you know maybe the experience itself when you you know drive them to soccer they end up in the, in the parking lot that's like probably five seconds um, but when you talk about it at home at dinner and remind, reminding your, yourself of it, at least that's like one minute, right? So like that expanded your five seconds, you know, by 20 times, like, right? So like then you basically suddenly um, to, 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 you know, get to a sense of, you know, basically you're prolonging the positive experience. And then having that positive time, I think is a, is a good addition to that tool. That's, that's so important. Thank you for that. Yeah, that just, you know, I'll say when something works out, I'll say to kids, how did it work? Like, what did you do that made that a success? Because that is, you want them to know that it's not magic. Like that's not magic. That's intention on their part. Yeah. They made a choice that they were able to do it. And so it's really important to process that. But, you know, another thing that I will often say with kids, if they do choose something that might be too easy for them, <laughs> you know, I'll say that could, that could really work. Here's the thing. I just, I, I want you to choose a step that you're going to feel proud of, you know, is that it, you know, would, would you feel proud, you know, with that step or is there something else you want to add to that? I, I say like, you know, if you have something in school that's too easy, you don't feel proud about it. Like, it's just like, it, it didn't challenge you at all. That's not going to feel as good. And if something is too hard, that you're not able to succeed with, that's not gonna feel good. You kind of wanna find that sweet spot right in the middle of what's the thing that is not too hard, but is a challenge that's gonna feel like, hey, I really got somewhere with this. Hmm. Yeah, I'm finding something that makes you proud. I think that's another, another million dollar question. <laughs> Perfect. My last question, I think I'm asking on behalf of many Chinese parents listening to this, because um, I think everybody now will agree. I mean, I guess I don't know if it's a good news or bad news. It's probably both that anxiety is a major problem now. And in, in the U.S., I know the data is about 20 percent, 20 plus, um, you know, percent of, of children have experienced it. And then in China, I think the number is at least that it's probably even higher, especially in certain age groups. If you're like, I think, high schoolers are much higher compared to the younger kids. Um, and most parents would feel reading this book may have this feeling. So, oh, this sounds cool. Um, you know, I, I see that works um, if, if, if the world is just me and my children, but I have to send them to school and school has its certain, you know, oppressive nature to it, right? So like a certain things you have to do and I as a parent have zero control over. Um, and then also some of the data I've seen recently is that 
not only the children, actually parents has a high level of anxiety as well. So like I have, you know, been struggling to deal with, you know, economic situation myself um, and all that. Um, so like, I think every every individual feel very small, you know, in, in, in face of a w overwhelming system, be it economics or school system or the evaluation system of education and all that. And then you feel like there's there's nothing I can do to change that. Seems like my only option is to cooperate. Um, and, and but it's really painful to cooperate, right? So like, um, what suggestion would you give them? Yeah, how do you, I think that, because this is a question I get a lot myself. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's so humbling to be alive, right? <laughs> it, it's such a gift too, but it's it's so humbling that there, I think, whether in, in your country, other places in the world, you know, there's things that we just think like, I don't want it to be this way. I just don't want things to work this way. And we can't just go in and, and change that necessarily. I mean, there may be some things that we can do to work towards change, but I think especially in situations where we don't have control of that big picture like that, it is even more essential to control what we can and that is our our mental state some of that you know i mean gosh for parents teaching about just how to uh come to some piece of acceptance of what we can change and what we can't because if we're constantly angry upset it's understandable about an oppressive system or whatever it may be, but it's not, it's it's understandable, but it wouldn't necessarily be adaptive for us. And that's a that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, right? But I think it's true that on the parent level, that it, you know, having that um, understanding that part of what we have to do is to accept some things that we don't, that we don't want to. Right. But then <laughs> that's going to help us to really focus on giving the best to our children at home. Who controls your kitchen table? We do. Who controls the conversation on the way to school? We do. You know, and that's in the end, I, I hope that that doesn't sound you know, my kids say like, you are just hopelessly optimistic, <laughs> you know, it's annoying sometimes, but like, how could I sit and do this work if I didn't? And I truly, I struggle with these same things too. You know, it's that I would like the world to be different in many ways. And I have to accept, you know, that there's some, that there are many things that I can't change, but we all have the realms in our own mind, in our bodies, in our relationships, in our families, when you tuck in your child at night, the conversations you have, oh my gosh, like in the end, drop by drop by drop of water like that. I mean, that's how we make ourselves the, you know, the best people that we can be in this world. So yeah. Well, that's deeply touching. And I, I totally agree with you. I remember the, the first book I recommended to some of my you know readers in my community is actually um, by this guy, um, Frank Vogel. You probably know him. He wrote this book called Men's Search for Meaning. And he was uh, for, I think, a period was basically in the concentration camp. And he lost everything, right? Like you're just a number, like, you know, you don't really know your family's alive and anything. And then, so he... Of course, he's a psychologist. He came out and wrote this book and saying, you know, like, even if we lost everything, we have, you know, that's probably the ultimately oppressive environment. <laughs> um, and he said, you always have one freedom. The freedom is the choices you made in your mind. Um, and then that's exactly what you're saying. And then oftentimes we dismiss that freedom. We're saying, ah, you know, what can I do? I'm still in jail. It doesn't matter. Oh, it matters, <laughs> right? It matters. In in his case, he survived. Um, he survived the concentration camp. He came out, and then, then of course he he wrote books, and then he became so influential and impacted a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. So it does matter. And second, there there's no there's no other way. Um, it's not like you know, like because 
our mind will think, oh, my other my other way is that I will gather some forces and like, you know, you know, combat them, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> You, you know, you will fail, like you'll die. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So, so it is, it is the way. So the way oftentimes as saying, like our mind will create a pathway. Um, but often those are, those are just illusions. And the real pathway are, are things like that is the choices you make is the realms you, you use, use your word, you create um, in spaces that's outside of the structure. And then once you start looking, as you said, there are many of them, like there, there are many hours you're spending with your children and you don't have to be a mouthpiece of whatever the system is, right? If you're aware and make a choice um, and you can decide what conversation goes on in your, in your house, what kind of food you eat, uh, what kind of places you go on weekends. So, so once you start looking, there, there are so many options, right? So <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's a, Again, it's a mindset shift and I I have to work on that myself. I, you know, things can be just so discouraging in the world. And I think like, right, but I have this moment now. <laughs> what do I want to do? You know, that's just, that's the truth to keep coming back to that idea that we, it's not just an idea, but it is, a, it is a, it's a practice though, for sure, because yeah, we can, it is understandable to be angry, frustrated, you know, despairing, all of that makes sense, but it might not be useful to us. What makes sense may not be useful all the time. What makes sense may not be useful. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's a, right. You know, this was sort of my my uh, mantra during the, the pandemic when people were, you know, just in, earlier in the pandemic. Uh, you know, so, so frightened and, you know, feeling just in the clutches of this uncertainty. And I would say, totally makes sense, totally understandable that you're feeling that way, but it's just not helpful to you because it completely immobilizes you. <laughs> so visit that, you know, make appointments with visiting that uncertainty, really, which we can do with worry too, you know, or anger or whatever about things we can't change, make appointments to go to those places, but make sure that then we leave and we have other experiences that we, you know, we are the designers of, especially our kids need to see that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Those are, those are so many gold nuggets. And I, um, so that's why you probably get a sense, you know, in Hammer's book, not only we get a lot of skill, you know, tools. And then I, again, as I said, I'm I'm exaggerating only slightly. You say there's a million, but there are many of them. But I said, but I think what's really behind it, deep, deep down, is the is the mindset change. That's what you just talked about. Is like, yes, life is hard, right? The world is an unpredictable place. But quote your words, you know, we're so lucky to be alive right are we we were lucky enough to be alive at this period of time so our personal choice is to make the best out of it yes. and then if we once you know that know that different mindset everything you know the framing will change i think that's probably more fundamental i think that's the second level and then the deepest level is what i mentioned in the very beginning is is the sense of fluidity <laughs> i think that's really dotted through the book is yes you can learn the tools because the tools are things we can words you can use behavior you can adjust but eventually um once you get the, the the sense of fluidity behind it or you know sort of beneath it i think those wisdoms you can come up with yourself too right is it you know once you are you know you you, you see you you're able to see the the places where things are stuck uh, you will have your own approach of unstucking it uh, but, but but of course we can learn by the approach that already worked but I think that's really the, that's how the three levels I see. There's tools, there's mindsets, and there's fluidity. <laughs> I so appreciate that reflection. It's so helpful. And I would just say, you know, I, I wrote another book for adults, uh, like a, a number of years later than these books, because, excuse me, because parents were finding that they were learning the tools for themselves reading the freeing your child from anxiety. So another point of this, you know, we touched on this earlier about parents having their own worries and fears that 
you'll learn these skills to use on yourself and that will just make it so much more, you know, you'll feel better, but it'll make Mm -hmm. it so much more natural to teach these skills to your kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. What's the name of the book for the adults? Freeing yourself from anxiety. (laughs) Excuse me. I'm losing. This is my voice. Yeah. Free yourself from anxiety. Freeing yourself from anxiety. Yeah. There you go. Look it up and hopefully cheers can bring that to the Chinese readers as well sometime down the road. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, wonderful. I know we're over time. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara, for spending this you know invaluable time with us and for sharing the wisdom in your book. Uh, and I truly enjoy the conversation. <laughs> I, I got $3 million out of it. <laughs> and uh, I think probably um, everybody reading it or listening to it probably feel the same. Um, and again, you can find the link to the book in the shopping cart, and then you can get the, the Chinese version home. Uh, and hopefully once you, you you know open the book, start reading, you'll benefit from all the wisdom and all the tools um, in your own lives. All right. Thank you again, Tama. Any last words you want to say to the audience? No? Thank you so much. This Sorry, you lost your voice. This <laughs> is my voice. <clears throat> this was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you.